Well, welcome everybody to the uh, the board game design workshop, which is really exciting. Um, but we were just talking a little bit of before that uh, Discord is actually a great platform for game designers, either board game or video game, uh, etc. Um, I, I think a lot of people who are in that world use this platform and connect on this platform. So it is, you know, if that's something you're interested in getting into, it's worth being aware of Discord here. Um, before we get into it, um, my name is Nate Shepard, and I am sort of the reason that ArtFest Online is happening. So if you're not aware, this workshop is actually part of a larger event that's happening through uh, the next nine or so days. Um, and we have just a few events every day, and the whole point of this festival is really just to provide opportunities for people to get into creative projects. Um, we don't really particularly care if people... Uh, tune into everything. Um, there is a fair amount that's happening, but our expectation is not to overwhelm your already busy schedules with more stuff. The idea is to really provide you, again, some, some opportunities to create things that you've never created before. I'm guessing a lot of you have never uh, done board game design before, and so um, this is a great opportunity to learn the ins and outs of that. Um, but I do want to point you to the website, artfestonline.com, because there's a ton of other free events that are happening. Um, particularly what might be of interest to the people in this group is um, we have an individual artist contest. And what this is, is that um, if you uh, design something based on the parameters that are laid out on the website under the contest page, um, during this week and submit it um, by the deadline, you have a chance of winning up to $200. Um, and a, I would totally love to see some custom designed board games. So if, if you're inspired by this and you want to create a board game, again, within the parameters that are laid out on the individual artist contest page, um, and you submit it, I would love to see some of that. Um, probably the best way to do it uh, is to just actually film a, a short video explaining how the game works and maybe showing some of the prototype stuff that you've created for it. And so uh, just look into that. Again, we've got a ton of other events that are happening. And so uh, if you're interested in participating in some other stuff, you can head over to ArtFest Online and uh, check some of that stuff out. So um, I've rambled enough. I'm going to hand it over to Andrew Voigt. Um, Andrew, if you don't mind introducing yourself a little bit and then just dive in. And then uh, we said this a little bit ago as well. Um, and then if you do have questions, uh, feel free to pop something in the chat. You can just jump up to the chat channel and it'll still show the, the live stream and type out your question and Andrew will be happy to answer um, some of your questions. And then uh, there will be a little bit of chance for dialogue as well uh, toward the end. So I've said enough. I'm going to hand it over to Andrew and uh, take it away. Uh, well, hi there. Uh, I'm Andrew Boyd. Uh, I am a uh, self-proclaimed, I, I suppose it's not self-proclaimed if I actually have stuff published, but uh, I'm a game designer. Um, and I just want to kind of take you guys through the basics of the process, what's involved, what's a, a first prototype look like, and what's something look like at the um, uh, end of the journey. Uh, so I've been designing games for about 10 or 11 years or so. Uh, my first game that was published, uh, well, my only game that's published so far, if I'm, uh, was called Perspective, uh, and that was published by Minion Games. Um, but here's Perspective. Here's the Kickstarter that funded. Um, uh, and so uh, this was published through Minion Games, and it was a um, two to four player uh, competitive memory and hand deduction game. So the premise behind this one, you got a hand of cards that are double sided, and uh, you're trying to get them organized in a certain pattern. So you're drawing cards and you're playing cards. And so this whole time the back of your hand is changing, but you never get a look back there. And so as you manipulate the cards throughout the game, you slowly uh, learn more and more about what's there. Um, but that was kind of my first um, published project, and that was done with Minion Games. Uh, my current project that I'm working on now is called Snow Day the Cold War. Uh, so Snow Day the Cold War is a tactical combat game, but it's uh, set up as a neighborhood snowball fight. Uh, and so you run around the yard to try and knock down the other team's snowmen, throwing snowballs, building up snow forts. Uh, let's see. Uh, I live in Minnesota. Uh, I have a wife and two kids, one who just turned 11 months, and the other one's about two and a half coming up on that third birthday very, very soon. So we have our handful uh, on that end. Uh, and then I work as an instructional designer um, professionally, which kind of goes hand in hand with the game design end of the world. But uh, that's just a, a little bit about who I am and what I've done. 
Uh, I also am active on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel called Andrew Voigt Designed. A lot of that's board game related. Uh, I have a series on how to uh, play on Tabletop Simulator, which is the most prominent uh, digital way to play board games. And then uh, I also do a lot of how to plays as well as uh, stuff for my own games of you know, marketing and awareness. But jumping into things, um, what you see here in the background is actually a first prototype of a survival game. It was called The Journey Home, uh, and I'll be talking more about that one near the end. But when we uh, jump into this concept, you know, people like to throw around the question of what is a game? Um, and I think this is a funny question because I, I have my own personal answer to it and everyone else does, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Um, we're designing games because what they are is something we enjoy. Uh, and so whether or not you're able to define what a game is doesn't really have an impact on um, what or how you create it. Now, what I would define a game as is an optional challenge, um, with the key component being some form of structure and a goal of some sort. Um, if there's not a goal, I'd argue it's not a game. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get an activity in a box that is fun and interesting. Um, there are some games, even like the game uh, Concepts, uh, which is kind of like Taboo, not really. A lot of people do this with Taboo, too, but where they play the game, but they don't keep track. They're not trying to win. They're just having a good time. Um, and that's a perfectly valid way to uh, move forward and uh, go ahead with uh, trying to design. Why do I love games? I've been, boy, back when I didn't know any better about what games were out there, uh, I grew up, I had like 10 different versions of Monopoly. Um, I played the three or four different versions of Risk out there. Uh, and I played a lot of, of older board games growing up that I really, really enjoyed. Um, and it wasn't really till mid to post-college that I realized what games are out there. Um, and so how I started in design uh, was after college, I had a, a month or two um, before getting in a job, and I was bored as all get out. Um, so I started uh, taking this thing I was interested in and messing around with it and trying to get, um, uh, trying to get something working there. Uh, and that actually eventually turned into my, uh, one of my favorite game projects uh, called Warp, which I'm not talking about today at all. Um, but that's, that's kind of where I started. Uh, but things I really love about games is the, the puzzles aspect, uh, the competition aspect, and it probably in the beginning all came down to the relation aspect. You can't sit down and play a board game with someone uh, without building a relationship, uh, especially now as become oh so more dependent on uh, technology uh, and it becomes a lot harder to interact with people. Um, just because the screens that are out there, the pace of our lifestyle, um, even in this case, to some degree, you guys are all here and you guys are typing in chat, but I'm more or less talking to a camera. Um, but when you sit down to do an activity like a game, you're able to sit down uh, and, and you're forced to interact with the people at the table and build those relationships. Um, now, when you're setting out to design a game from the get-go, um, you, oops, wrong way. Uh, you have a variety of things that you're going to need to take into consideration. Um, you know, you have uh, games that are simple and light that can take as long as 30 seconds to a minute, and then you have games that are complex and as depth that can take 8, 10, 12, 15 hours. Uh, and so uh, when you're talking about, you know, what is a game and and why, uh, what is a game and what are you designing? There's really such a broad range in there um, that when you start out, it's helpful to have a handful of things in mind. Um, and first and foremost, uh, we're going to talk about art and thematics and graphics. Um, and graphics should be graphic design end of it. Um, because as you're designing a game, uh, the aesthetic is very important. Uh, one of my favorite jokes when it comes to uh, uh, building uh, prototypes and having strangers test your game is uh, you've made some changes to a game and you feel really good about it as a designer and you sit down and you play it with some strangers and the game goes fine and at the end uh, you're talking through some of the feedback you're looking for and one of them stops and says you know the game was fun but I could have really used art 
Um, and and which is is really funny because during a lot of the design process of a game, uh, you're using placeholder art, and that's not something that the designer has a a access to. But on the other side, when you're talking about the end product of art, um, that final visualization of your game is very, very important to the total experience. So you as the designer have to have this concept, has to have this concept of what's my end goal like versus uh, what's actually there on the table. Uh, I'm going to pull up a couple examples. Uh, and this is back uh, to Snow Day. That's the, uh, so this is one of the end versions of the game and what it looks like. This is a, a final picture of what the vision of Snow Day is. We have this colorful um, backyard with a group of, of neighborhood kids, and they all have their special skill sets. Like this one's good at climbing. This one's good at uh, uh, uses her sled to um, both move faster across the snow, and she can hold up her sled as a shield. So you have these thematic elements that that are always part of vision, the vision of the game. But a lot of times your play testers aren't going to be able to see that. For example, uh, here is one of the first versions of Snow Day. That same game, we have a big white board. Um, that's literally just grid paper. There's nothing on it uh, with a handful of characters, uh, uh, generic pawns that are thrown on there. And that was the whole game. And so you sit down and play with someone, and they can't quite see that end vision. So as a designer, you have to have that, that uh, moment passed of how do, how do I create an experience that includes a visual component, um, but when your game isn't solid enough, it doesn't make sense to put the effort into those visual components because realistically um, anything from this early stage of the process ends up getting thrown out. Uh, and so then beyond the art uh, and thematics end of it, uh, there are some games that rely heavily on art and thematics and they don't have a lot much of a game to them. And so where the purpose of these games are to entertain an interesting story. One example are the games based off of H.P. Lovecraft's material, the Arkham Horror type games, um, where it's a lot of encounters, a lot of text, a lot of reading, and the mechanics are overall pretty simple and come secondary to the theme. And then lastly is the, the graphics. How do you display information on your cards? Um, one of my favorite examples of this Perspective is a game with a bunch of colored cards, and each of these colored cards has a corresponding action. My very first prototype of this game was this one up here. Literally, I had white cards with black text on it saying yellow, blue, red, green. I didn't even have the actions that those colors performed uh, listed on the cards. I sat down and played this with a group of people, and a lot of people played the game, and they're like, I don't think it'll work. Um, but I had that final vision of it, and I understood what was going on. So I was able to look past what those, those players were able to see and say, no, in, in my final version, I feel like the art and the mechanics are going to fit better together. Uh, next is mechanics. Um, the mechanics are, are you know, what I think a lot of people would think of the game part of the game. Uh, and one of my favorite oh, spectrums in this conversation is the concept of uh, depth versus complexity. Uh, how complex is your game, and does it merit the, uh, does the enjoyment someone gets out of it merit how hard that game is to learn? Uh, like with Snow Day, one of our goals with that, uh, so the genre or what category that type of game falls into would be called tactical combat. Um, you know, dudes on a map trying to take on each other. Uh, and usually that genre has a, a stigma to it that people look at it and it looks overwhelming and confusing because some of the more uh, traditional games of that will go as far as having measuring tapes or laser pointers to line, uh, measure out line of sight uh, to see whether or not you can hit a target. And so from a mechanic end of that, uh, we're looking at, hey, can we work in that genre, but can we make those mechanics simpler so that it's more uh, accessible to people who haven't played games as often? And then you have the question of what's the, what's the uh, interaction between players? Um, so a mechanic is anything from rolling a die and moving your, your Monopoly guy, uh, those six spaces. Or another example of dice would be in Settlers of Catan, where you roll and then you get your crops. Then another mechanic is how you do that, that trading. So a mechanic is essentially anything you do in a game. Um, 
and uh, can range from very simple, like the ones I mentioned, uh, to more complex ones, like uh, uh, certain um, deck building games like Magic the Gathering or, uh, or Netrunner, where you play a card that literally has two paragraphs on, of text on it that depends on three other cards that you already have play on the board. And those are all mechanics. And the challenge with mechanics is how do we word them and teach them and present them in such a way is that they're, they're very understandable. The, 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 one of my biggest pet peeves is um, on how we word things. So like in Snow Day, you can do a build action which lets you build two snowballs, two snow forts, or one of each. There is no good way to describe that mechanic. Because uh, I... Yeah. And so... The hard part about mechanics is how do we word them in a way that makes them simple enough for people to be able to do without getting caught up because there's that complexity versus depth issue. Is this game fun enough to warrant how difficult it is to learn? And then there's just practical restrictions. Uh, developing uh, board games has a very much of an iterative, pro iterative process. Because if you want to tweak something, a lot of times you need a new component, whether you need to write out a new card or print a whole new um, um, board. For example, with uh, Snow Day again, uh, I have these different maps on here. Uh, and if I wanted to try out a different map, I would need to draw it, I would need to print it, I would need to put it out. And um, because everything interacts with everything else, uh, it's very hard to test isolated things reliably. Uh, another good example is each of my characters have a special player power that only they can do. Like I said, the, the sledder can hold up her shield and get a bonus while she's defending. Or the drone boy uh, has a drone that he can send to drop a snowball behind someone else's snow fort. Uh, and so each of these things need to be tested not only in their own, but in the context of the other abilities and boards. Um, one uh, really good example on that is uh, the ice skater here can turn when on ice. And if our boards aren't built right, that ability can let her get all the way across the map in a way that's really not fair. Um, but that's a situation where it wasn't, the ice mechanic wasn't bad and her ability wasn't bad, but the way that we set up the two to land together uh, caused kind of a toxic situation. Uh, and so practical restrictions have a lot to do with, you know, what's your cost? What's your cost for development? Uh, if you're planning on publishing, what's going to be your end cost uh, for that? Uh, another funny one here is our snow forts in Snow Day actually stack these little blue pieces. And we played around with having three snow forts stacking at one point. But the reality is if we wanted to actually get this through production and have a price point low enough for people to buy it, uh, we decided to cut snow forts so you could only stack, stack two instead of three. And so even during the design process, that question of what's our end cost going to be um, plays in the mind. And whether you're planning on publishing it yourself or handing it off to a publisher, uh, that's, that's actually a very important part of game design. Now, if you're just designing as a hobby, you can have something as big and as elaborate as you'd like, obviously. Uh, and then lastly is people. Uh, people are the thing that make board games as an art fit unique um, and most challenging. Uh, because what you're doing here is your board games, in my mind, uh, designing board games well is a question of how do we move people's emotions? Um, because we're trying to incite people's emotions of excitement. Sometimes we want people to get, to get um, not frustrated in a bad way, but in a, a wanting to overcome it kind of a sense. Uh, or how do we get people to enjoy the feeling of working together? Um, or one of my projects, uh, The Dark Forest, uh, is uh, essentially a, a horror board game um, where uh, it's my attempt to use a board game to tell a story. But the premise is, is everyone has an individual character and you all have a different reason for being in the woods on Halloween night. Uh, and the long story short is uh, you all have a mission to accomplish. If you accomplish it, um, your character you know, goes through character growth, and if you don't accomplish it, then they end up having some terrible result. Um, but there's a lot of narrative elements there where people have to choose along the way. Um, you know, a, a bad example, but an example is you round a corner and someone's standing there with a gun pointed at you. 
And then the card's going to say, do you try and attack them and disarm them, or do you dive in the bushes and try and get away? Uh, and so my goal there is to try and control the writing in such a way that really involves the players in their situations to try and get them a uh, role play in a board game. Um, and my original goal when I made that game was asking the question, can I make a board game that actually makes people feel emotions? Um, and I actually went towards narrative and um, I actually went towards narrative and fear because fear is a very easily manipulated emotion. Uh, one of my newer projects, which was the one on the original slide, this one here, uh, my end goal with this one is to get people to get a sense of exploration and discovery. Um, it's called The Journey Home, and the premise is you and your group have arrived on a, uh, your plane crashed on a desert island, and you need to explore and make your way off the island. Um, but every game, the setup changes in its own way, so you're never going to escape the island the same way twice. And my goal there is, can I create a board game where throughout the process of playing, we have a sense of exploration and discovery? Um, I'm about 10 slides ahead of where I meant to be right now. But, um, so I guess at this point I want to pause and, and kind of hear where uh, you guys are all sitting. Uh, if anyone has any questions or observations at this point. Oh, when do I start making a rulebook for a game? Uh, so when do I start writing a rulebook for a game? There are a few different philosophies on this. I don't write rulebooks for my game. Um, this is actually one of my goals for my... Uh, uh, over the next years, I want to go back and actually write rule books for games I haven't. Uh, for myself, I only ever write a rule book where I plan to pass the game off to someone else. Um, so if I'm planning on having a conversation with a publisher about a game, then I'll sit down and I'll write the rule book. If I'm planning on handing out my uh, you know, design, uh, either digitally or physically, for another group to play, um, that's when I bother to sit down and write a rule. Uh, a lot of other designers like to write the rule books as they go, um, which I don't think I'll ever do that, um, just because uh, you iterate and change between your game tests a lot, uh, and it would just be a lot of wasted time and energy, I do believe, writing rules. So I guess to answer that question as succinctly as possible, I begin writing my rule book when I need someone else to play my game without me. But then that process of writing the rulebook really helps you uh, identify those fine-tuned situations that you sometimes overlook. How do you choose between mechanic and story? Uh, that is totally up to what resonates with you. I'm a, I am a bit of a snob, uh, uh, even when it comes in the design community, um, about uh, mechanics and stories matching up. Um, because in my opinion, uh, the two should not be separate. Um, if I'm playing a game that has a story to it, if I'm playing a game that has a strong theme to it, uh, I want the mechanics to make sense within that theme. Um, but I'm also someone who, uh, yeah, so I, I think that's, that, that's the easiest way to say it. Um, now, how do I choose between mechanic and story? So perspective, uh, and I'm learning to become a little more flexible on this, perspective does not have a theme. Um, it has a loose sense of, oh, these are the elements. We used wind, water, fire, and earth. Um, but those don't tie into the actual actions. Uh, and in my mind, perspective was always an abstract game, essentially a game without a theme. Um, but something like The Dark Forest, where my goal to create was to create an emotion uh, in that case, uh, I'm going to pull up a picture of that one, just a second. Uh, in that case, my goal was to create the uh, theme first. And so uh, really, oh, 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 there we go. Um, so really to answer that question of whether I choose, or when do I choose between story and mechanic, it comes down to the game. Uh, when I'm designing the Dark Forest, if I had a situation where my mechanic came in conflict with my um, narrative, I would let go of the mechanic to keep the connection to the narrative. So for something like uh, Warp, uh, which, is, uh, which is a tactical combat game, uh, sci-fi, where you have lasers and wormholes and things like that, 
Um, this was very much a mechanics first design. My goal in making this game was, um, well, I'm going to talk about that later, but essentially I wanted to see if a, uh, I could work in a genre that relies heavily on chance and have no chance in the game whatsoever. So with Warp, my primary focus was mechanic over thematic. Um, one of the things I'd like to do with this is go back and write a little bit of more narrative to it, because right now it's just a pretty coat of paint on some good mechanics, and there's no actual theme to it. Uh, where do I get inspiration from a game? Um, uh, I will cover that uh, a lot more near the end, but uh, uh, for myself, uh, I'm a big video gamer, and so I actually get a lot of inspiration from the video games I play. Uh, so The Dark Forest, which was that narrative, you're lost in the forest game, how do we create a game to tell a story and create an emotion? I would say my two biggest influences for that were actually the video game Long Live the Queen, um, uh, which is uh, uh, the most fun you can have as being a teenage girl. Uh, the objective of that game is you're essentially overseeing the education of uh, a young princess who is set to become queen in a year. And depending on how you educate her and the choices you ever make throughout the year, uh, the story can end in a variety of different ways, from you dying from eating bad chocolate, spoilers, uh, to you becoming an all-powerful sorceress, to you becoming a benevolent queen over your people. Um, and I thought that was such an interesting way to dive in and tell a story uh, and that I want to see if I could do that same sort of thing in a board game. And then um, uh, for the, the Yogg is the other one that, uh, the Yogg is the other one that, uh, sorry, the Yogg is another video game that inspired me to try and do that story end of things, uh, which that's like a 10 minute game where you play where uh, it's, it's in, you're in a small town where apocalypse is about to happen and your character just goes through and lives their daily choices throughout the week and then the apocalypse happens and depending on what you did or didn't do that week, the end of the story uh, changed. But those were two video games that had very good emotional through lines um, or at least very good opportunities to build emotional moments. And I said, hey, can I do this in a board game? Um, and so I'll, I'll get to this question more uh, uh, near uh, the end of our time here. Um, but in short, I get a lot of from board games, and then I also get a lot of essentially seeing what other people did and me not liking it. Uh, or just seeing if I could do it differently. You know, perspective is that memory and hand management game. Um, and uh, that took inspiration from the card game Hanabi, which is a cooperative game where... You never get a look at the uh, face of your cards, where it's always facing your partners. And I basically said, is there any way to do that same kind of concept, although doing it in a competitive set setting rather than a cooperative setting? Uh, all right, I have a, a few more things I wanted to go through. Uh, if no one else has any questions they want to jump on at the moment. Um, and so with all of these concepts that play into uh, game design, we have to ask our question, what's our design goals? Um, because the reality of the situation is every one of these is very, very, very important. And unless we start out with saying, what's our design goal, uh, we're not going to be able to balance all of them. You know, that, that goes back to the question of how do you choose between mechanic and story? Um, if my goal is to have a very narrative-driven game, well, then I'm going to choose... Um, my my design goal guides my decisions along the way. Or even with Snow Day, uh, when we talk about uh, making it uh, accessible, uh, accessible to people was a huge priority for us. Uh, and so there were numerous situations where we tried to add something and we liked what we added but we ended up saying this makes the game a lot harder than we want the game to be for people to learn. And so we scratch it. Um, and so when you set out to make a game, you take a moment to think about, oh, what's, what's, what's the purpose of this game? And how do I make that as cleanly as possible? Uh, design goals help a lot in the later development processes. Um, uh, so... Uh, my theory on a good way to build a board game is to build too much and then start chopping pieces off. And when you get to that chopping pieces off stage, how do we remove rules and mechanics and paragraphs from the rule book? Okay, and so when we talk about design goals, 
Uh, it's a question of what's the focus of your design. Now, especially if you've never designed a game before, that sounds intimidating. You're like, how do I make all these hard decisions? And the truth of it is, um, to be fun is a good goal. It's not good direction, but it's a good goal. Um, where um, if it just something interests you, go for it. And as you start to get a taste for the design process, then you can step away and say, no, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but this was really important to me when I thought of this I game idea. And so a lot of it is through trial and error and just experimentation. Um, and so really... Uh, what I've written in my notes is to be fun is a good goal, but it's not very helpful. Um, and so I have some examples of things that can be used uh, for narrowing down what this design goal is. Uh, and these are a lot of what I was talking about when it comes to the motivations um, and where did I get my inspiration. So for example, uh, a good thing to ask it is it for profit or is it for fun? Do you just want to share this with some of your other game, or uh, do you want to share this with some of your other friends, or is this something you're trying to make money with? You know, um, or some people even at conventions literally make you know ten card games that are entirely meant as a marketing purpose, um, and that's and so uh, you have to ask the question is why are you starting this design? Uh, once you have that, you can look into some of the other questions. So examples of design goals I have. Um, so for mechanics, uh, my example with Warp, that uh, sci-fi shooter game I was talking about, uh, what would a tactical combat game be without any chance? So tactical combat games are usually war games, and they're usually, um, you know, your, your character can move so many spaces and can shoot so far, and then you roll to see if you hit. That's an oversimplification of what they are. Um, and I said, is, can I make a game that has that same concept of the units on a map that move and shoot and try and accomplish an objective, but I can't have any chance? I can't have random card draws, I can't roll dice, and I can't flip a coin to see who starts the game. Uh, and so uh, uh, Warp is a game that from the moment you sit down to the table to the moment you finish it, there is not one random event in there. Now. That goal creates a lot of challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges it comes down to is uh, unpredictability. Um, there are very few games that can successfully pull off uh, a truly um, uh, open knowledge where everything, uh, like chess, chess is a perfect knowledge game. Um, and, and those are usually hard to make, and for some people they're less interesting. Um, and the, the challenge with them is that once someone starts winning in a lot of those games, then it's a snowball. So I had to look into Warp and say, okay, how do I create that sort of a move and roll and shoot concept, but uh, someone still has to be um, unsure of whether or not they're making the right decision. And so I went through about eight different iterations of ways that people could plan out their actions. So what I ended up doing is... Uh, I ended up having people at the beginning of the game uh, choose from a set of like eight different character uh, variations. I had someone who was a scout who could move fast, but they couldn't do a lot of damage. I had someone who was a tank who had a lot of defensive options, but they weren't the fastest. A lot of your general archetypes. You know, I had someone, a sniper, who had a lot of uh, weapons with really long range. Um, but if you got too close to them, they would be uh, uh, vulnerable. Um, and so I use action cards for all these cards. And a lot of my iterations of the game, you would actually plan your actions one or two turns in advance. Um, and so that created a moment of um, my opponent has committed to an action. And if I can guess what that action is before he gets to use it, then I'll get an edge in the next round. But my design decision of not using any chance... Um, really uh, uh, was really the hard part of that process. Uh, even coming down to something as simple as turn order, because almost every game has some random thing at the beginning of it to say, oh, this team is the team that goes first. Um, you know, another uh, one of my design goals was uh, with perspective. Uh, can I use this uh, cooperative mechanic of not being able to see the back of my, my card hand can I use that mechanic in a competitive way where no one's helping me out, but I need to know the back of my hand of my cards. Um, 
Other ones I have written here is, can a game create emotions? Uh, can a game tell a compelling story? Or even, uh, how can a game create a sense of discovery, uh, like the, um, uh, the journey home, that lost in an island example? Uh, I like to borrow ideas a lot. Um, some people, when they're getting new in design, they say, I, ha I have this game idea that's really similar to something I see out there. Uh, I feel really nervous about doing it, though. Um, and the short answer is don't feel nervous about doing it. Uh, you're not stealing. Uh, each generation is built on the shoulders of the giants before them. Uh, our, our games that we have today um, are standing on the shoulders of every generation's games. Um, and by generation, I mean like two years. You see new mechanics popping out. But um, uh, you get the idea. And so if there's something you're interested in that's similar to an existing game, just do it. The experience, the creativity, and the fact you're interested in it uh, is worth doing it. Now, if you're hoping to pitch a game to a publisher, um, you might want to make sure there's something in that game that stands out. Uh, one example I always have in my mind is the difference between uh, Dominion and Ascension. And I know I'm just name dropping here. So. so Dominion and Ascension are both what you would call deck building games. Uh, deck building games where you have a big pile of cards that you choose from and as you're playing the game uh, you create a deck that you're drawing cards from and playing those cards and some of those cards let you buy more cards to put in the deck so on and so forth so dominion and ascension are both deck building games um, but they're a little bit different the biggest difference between them in my mind is the fact that in dominion you have 10 cards that you can purchase those 10 cards change every game, but you always have 10 cards to purchase from. Whereas in Ascension, you have a set of five cards in the middle of the table that change every round. Every time one card is purchased, a different random card takes its place. And so that's an example of two games that are 80% the same, um, but yet they're both published and very, very successful. So when it comes down to it, yes, borrow ideas and then add your own flair in there. Um, a lot of times the, the important part of the game is the final execution of it and it's not the idea of it. Because um, uh, there are millions and millions, well, hundreds and hundreds of games of dudes on a map um, that run around and shoot each other. But they're all a little bit different and they all have their own flair. And, the, and, and that's good, because it's that little bit of flair that players are interested in. What makes you you? Um, let's see. Uh, otherwise, a lot of people like to do game design challenges. Uh, so, for example, they'll sit down and say, I have 18 cards here. Can I make a game with them? Uh, I actually had a friend. Um, his game Blend Off is a game about making smoothies uh, uh, for when a school bus of a uh, high school volleyball team shows up after a game, they go to a smoothie shop and they all buy a bunch of smoothies. So the actual game is you're rolling dice to try and pick fruit to put into a blender to make the right smoothies. Um, but that game came out of a design contest. There was a company that said, we have this list of like, you know, I think it was like 50 cards and 30 cubes. Um, and I think a little bit more, oh, and two dice or something like that. And they said, can you make a game using these limited components? And so uh, he did the challenge, and he put those components together, and he came out with a, a really fantastic game that the creativity was brought about because he had that restriction on there. Um, I'm someone who likes to try and improve things a lot, so a lot of my designs are seeing something someone else tried and simply asking, do I think I can do it better or in a more interesting way? Um, and, and not even to... Um, when I say better, not even to put down their work, but there's an aspect of that game that I really like that I want to draw out. Um, a big one is the narrative. A lot of games have some sort of story and narrative to them, um, but a lot of them don't give, them, give that part of it much attention, which is where The Dark Forest came, is saying, can I take that part of these games and draw it out to make it still a game, but also not reading a book? Um, and the hard thing with that is how do you get someone to read several pages of text over an hour without getting bored or feeling like they're just reading? Um, 
So I wanted to do a, a quick overview of uh, Snow Day's journey, um, just where Snow Day came from and where it is today, uh, just so you can see a little bit of the design process. We're running short on time, so I'm just going to kind of pick a few pictures along the way. We already looked at um, this first one here. Uh, so this is Snow Day uh, in its very emphases. Uh, that's actually the second prototype, the first prototype was basically the same but i didn't have any of these cards out here and it was just yellow cubes were the snow forts and colored cubes were the characters um and so uh you want to do that when you're building a game is it's, it's the fail faster mentality of just get something together and try it because um that's going to give you a taste for what people found interesting about the game, and you can grab onto that little snippet of the game and move forward with it. Uh, and then in our next iteration, we started adding in ice patches, and we had dirt patches at once. Um, we eventually cut the dirt patches uh, uh, just because it didn't didn't fit at the time. Um, but ice patches, uh, I think, are one of the more um, Oh, what's the word? Oh, creative. Um, I haven't seen it before things um, in Snow Day, where when you step onto an ice patch, you keep moving, but it doesn't cost you any movement. So, so for example, you know, if you're on this space here and you go one, two, you'll slide all the way here, three, four. Um, so ice really, we saw people use the ice and they absolutely loved it. So we knew that that had to be a core part of the design moving forward. Uh, these are the original cards that we had with the game, and those were in it at this stage. So whenever your character would get hit, you'd draw a card and it would do a thing. Uh, like, this is an ice ball. Um, so you'd play it when you're throwing at someone else and you deal two damage instead of one. Um, and here's a good example to show where the, the, the theme grows over time. Back here we were still calling it damage, now we call it frost. Um, because you're not getting killed your character gets too cold and they have to go inside in the house to warm up with a cup of hot cocoa. Uh, and so there were, were the difference between damage and frost. There is no difference between damage and frost, but how we talk about the game makes the game feel different. Uh, and so once we knew that ice was a thing, I drew on a bunch of um, uh, boards that uh, I think, I don't think any of these stayed, um, but I started drawing on a bunch of boards of saying, hey, uh, where should we put our ice on our boards? Because we knew we wanted to experiment with uh, that idea. Uh, by this point, we knew that we wanted to move the game forward and try and uh, make a real product about it. So we started to pay for some character art, as you see on these little standees. Uh, and I was really proud of these boards because uh, the new ice we had on there, I actually drew, and I am the worst artist in the world. And I was really excited. Uh, to sit down and draw something that I actually felt good about. Um, but uh, let's see. And so then as your game grows, you slowly add more and more details to it. Now you'll see we removed our, our square cardboard tokens. So we had square cardboard tokens representing snow forts. Uh, and this was actually the hardest thing to figure out for the design. Because originally they covered a whole space and we didn't like that. Uh, and I, I really didn't like that. So I eventually moved to these tokens. They're still taking up a space. I didn't find my solution for that. But I liked having physical tokens that stacked with some height because these kids were hiding behind the snow forts. Uh, here's another example of the hand-drawn boards from a, a, another angle. And then by the time we got to the next version, things really started to shape up. Um, as you can see here, uh, by this point, we actually paid an illustrator for the boards because we found ice layouts that we felt really good about. And all this time, we're going through um, these little changes and adding and cutting things. By this point, those cards that we started with, we cut them out. We felt like the cards that people were playing with um, didn't add enough to the game. They felt like they were, they were just another thing that people had to handle. And it didn't really make the game more interesting because I started trying to play the game with people without the cards. And everyone was like, yeah, we like it. We didn't feel like it was missing anything. So we cut them. Uh, and so as you go through the process, all of a sudden, as you have more and more people, like I said, people, people are the problem when designing a game, because how do you get them to play it and enjoy it? And, and how are they going to interact with your game? 
Uh, this is a case where everything got messed up because my two nephews played the game together. And in the dozens and dozens and dozens of plays I had had up to the time, I never once had this problem. So what happened is uh, Jasher, my one nephew, he was defending and he was losing. He had one snowman left. So he, rather than trying to sneak through a win and sneak to the other uh, player's side, uh, he just put all his characters around his snowman and just stood there. And so every time Addison got anywhere close enough to, to even make an attempt to get it, he would have all four characters throw snowballs at him. And so the game was never going to end. Yeah, he, he was playing to not lose rather than playing to win. You never know when someone's going to accidentally break your game. Um, and so then I had to work on developing some no baby guarding rules. Let's see. Another fun thing is with Snow Day, we felt that the snow forts were a really important part of the process. Um, because the theme, again, theme versus mechanics, uh, uh, it's very important, we felt in this game, that theme and mechanics match up very, very well. Um, because we want this to be an entry to a genre, so we need it to be appealing from a mechanics perspective from everyone who plays the genre, and yet we need it to be a welcoming thematically for everyone who um, uh, hasn't played it before. And we felt a snowball fight is a really good situation where people can imagine it going on in their head, and the rules all make sense in that context. Um, and yet we created up a, a system with the snow forts and by removing line of sight um, that we felt had some interesting mechanic elements to it. But so the snow forts uh, were a fun process because we actually got to 3D print those. And that was uh, my first, uh, well, that was, that was one of my first times doing anything uh, 3D printing. Uh, Sam's going to be mad at me if I don't show this one because uh, he printed these snowmen for me. So at one point early in the process, we were we were thinking, oh, it'd be really cool if our snowmen were actually made of three pieces. That way we could have a game mode where you're trying to build a snowman rather than knock it down, and that way you have to knock a snowman down in pieces. Uh, this is an idea we ended up cutting just because it was, it was too much, it was too complicated, and in the end product, at this stage, the, the snowman would have been um, too expensive to finish building, or to, too expensive to have in the box. Um, but we really liked the idea of having these adorable little stackable snowmen. Let's see. And so that's a, that's a great example of something we loved that we chose to cut for reasons that we felt were beyond us. Uh, just a quick snapshot is here's a process of the card development uh, all side by side. So in the beginning, our cards were very plain. Just uh, that, that first prototype should always be just get it to the table. Um, and then the next one had a little bit more flair. I found some placeholder art. Um, so then uh, it has a little bit more table appeal. Uh, and the more and more design, the more and more appeal. Table appeal is important for uh, those prototypes. Uh, and then lastly, we got the characters on the card, and we started to do some layout adjustments. And then these are actually, it's going to take forever to load, but these are the current version of the cards. There we go. Where we have some additional color going on. But... Uh, so that's a little bit of the progress of what, what um, Snow Day looked like. Uh, and that's kind of what we ended with, um, where we are now. We've made some updates from there, but that's the general concept. And that's kind of the journey that uh, Snow Day, the Cold War, has taken. Uh, we're out of time, so I'm going to leave you guys with a handful of resources. I'm going to share a link in the um, Discord chat. Uh, this link will get you to a page where I have some uh, resources listed down at the bottom that are going to tell you um, what's useful for a game designer uh, getting started. What are the Facebook groups you need to be in? Um, and what are some of the tools? Uh, how can you learn to do it well? So I'm going to go ahead and just paste this here. Uh, and if you can't access that, I will make sure to adjust the uh, permissions afterwards. But uh, I'm going to talk through just these resources quick uh, and then um, we're over time, so uh, we can be done, but I'll sit around and talk if anyone likes to. Um, first thing I want to mention is the Game Crafter. Uh, it's where I get all my prototypes printed. But the Game Crafter has a phenomenal service, and they're very, very involved with the community. I highly recommend them. Uh, and then we have Component.studio. Uh, Component Studio is a uh, prototype design software. Uh, there's actually a tutorial series that I made that you can find on the web. There's a link to the YouTube. 
You can find some free art. A lot of my placeholder art comes from gameicons.net and pixbay.com. Uh, here are some Facebook groups you should join. If you guys are interested in doing any game design, I highly encourage you to get out there. Just try it. Get some paper out. Um, scratch some ideas down on paper. And literally, my first cards that I ever made, um, I had taken an Excel, Excel spreadsheet out, and I had just wrote the card detail in single shells cells of Excel, printed that page out, and cut them out. So I had teeny tiny cards that were about that big that I was trying to play a game with. That's all I have, so I want to take some time to answer any questions. Uh, Sam, I don't test my games. I just uh, uh, put them together, and they always work perfectly. Um, so one of the things, one of the things that um, are on that resource list is I mentioned Protospiel and Facebook groups. Uh, Playtesting is very, very, very hard to come by because a lot of times you want people who are fresh to a game to play it. Um, and so your two main sources of playtesters are going to be your close friends who may play your game again and again and again. And that's good because they get a look at it from an experienced uh, point. Um, secondly, a game design group. Uh, Sam uh, Samuel, who's in this group, uh, is uh, one of the guys that I oftentimes play my games with, uh, as well as um, Scott Eaton, who you may know of as the co-designer on Codenames Duet. Uh, and so uh, we would play each other's games a lot to try and run it through the ringer with experienced eyes. And then, um, and then we go to events like Protospiel. Uh, Con of the North is uh, an event local to Minneapolis that has um, a lot of people playing games on. So uh, it, really, whoever you can beg, borrow, and steal to do it is the hard thing. Now with uh, everything going on with the uh, coronavirus, it's a little bit easier to do so digitally. but. Um, what was a game that blew away your mind when you first played it? And you guys can open up your mics for this. I, I Go ahead and, and we can have a conversation at this point. Uh, what was a game that blew away my mind when I first played it? Uh, Spirit Island actually is a new one that I absolutely loved. I think it came out a year or two ago. Um, but the premise is you and your... It's a co-op game. So you and the people you're playing with are different spirits that inhabit an island that um, uh, outlanders are trying to come and, and develop and establish the land. Uh, and so you're balancing resources from maintaining the health of the land and driving out the invaders. Um, and it's, it, that one has a lot of layers to it. Uh, I think I didn't actually know how to play the game until I played it my second or third. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, that one's Spirit Island. Uh, how do you find a company to produce your game? Ah, ha, ha. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's, that's a funny question. It depends, really. Uh, so with Perspective, uh, like I said, that was published by Minion Games. I actually knew the owner of Minion personally by going to different board game events. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's the, the board game industry is very, very friendly. Everyone wants to help you there. So it's very easy to sit down and meet important people. Um, if you're showing up to these events. Um, and so uh, we were actually at a protospiel. I went to lunch, and uh, someone else uh, was playing my game with him because I, I left it um, behind. And when I came back from lunch, uh, James, the owner of Minion Games, uh, waved me down and told me he wanted my game. Uh, so that was kind of funny, but that is not the normal process. Uh, so the real way of um, pitching to publishers is uh, what you're going to do is usually before a big event, you're going to send out emails to any publisher that might be interested in what you have. Um, uh, and that is a hour long lecture in itself. Um, but part of that is uh, doing what research you can to see if they're, if they want games similar to the ones they already have, or if they want games that are, are brand new. Um, but before a big event and by before, I mean, one to three or so um, months in advance, go ahead and send out emails saying, hey, are you going to be at such and such event? I have a game you might be interested in. Here's a one-minute video that's a pitch, or two-minute or three-minute, just not, not very long. Here's a quick video that's a pitch of it. I'd love to be able to sit down and show you my game. Are you planning on being there? Um, and, and do all the typical sales uh, strategy thing. Of don't do a bulk email. Make sure there's something personal in there. Um, give them give them a reason to open it. 
Uh, and then they'll open the email and they'll say, yeah, uh, so-and-so is looking at uh, pitches for our company and you can set up an appointment with him. Here's his email. Um, and that's how it goes a lot of time. And then you meet them at the event. You pitch them their game. After you pitch the game, which is usually a five-minute sit down and show me what you got. Um, if they like it, then they'll say, okay, do you have a copy I can play? You leave that copy with them and... Um, and they take that and play that with their own people and then usually get back to the, you and say yay or nay. I mean, usually it's nay, but um, uh, not always. Now, in the board game industry, it's very, very common for people to uh, try and be self-publishers um, using crowdfunding. And that's what uh, I'm attempting with Snow Day the Cold War. Uh, myself and a friend called Joel McGuire have been working on that. But uh, yeah, that's, that's how you would find a company to produce your game. It's, you, just, you just reach out to them. Um, I personally got tired of doing that um, just because, not just because it was a lot of rejected, but it felt like a lot of wasted time because I was spending a lot of energy just trying to present my game rather than to um, uh, improve it or make something happen. Uh, and so um, you, you really got to ask yourself, um, uh, you got to really check with yourself of what your motivations around doing it are. Um, but yeah. Uh, build a big list of publishers, um, and oftentimes, a lot of times, conventions will publish who's going to be at their convention ahead of time. Go through that list, see the companies that stand out, and send them notes. Uh, other than that, it's get involved personally. Um, just up here in Minneapolis, you know, I, I know personally uh, the publishers of Root, which is probably one of the biggest games of the last year. I know the publisher of Floodgate Games. I know the publisher of... Um, uh, it's a role player and Thunderworks game, um, and and it's just a matter of building those relationships. And any of those people, uh, I mean, as far as I would know, if I said, "Hey, I have a game we want to show you," would gladly sit down and play with me um, uh, for me to pitch it to them. Um, but the reality is, is I haven't. I I have made a choice, at least for the time being, um, that I haven't pitched to a publisher in several years now. All right. Well, I am recording this, uh, and I'll I'll probably put it up. Uh, I'll give it to Nate to put wherever they're planning on putting it, um, and then I'll probably put a copy of it on my YouTube channel. Uh, please, if you have questions or you want me to point you in the right direction of how to get started, go ahead and uh, send me an email or ping me on Facebook or Discord. Uh, my name's Andrew Voigt. Uh, you can find me at Andrew Voigt Design on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, or you can leave a note in this Discord chat as well. Go ahead and friend me. Um, and I, the, the board game community is so friendly and helpful that it's not very hard to find support. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, again, we have a ton of stuff going on over at ourfestonline.com, uh, including uh, this occurs to me that uh, starting in, in uh, actually about 45 minutes, um, is another workshop that's a choose your own adventure creative writing workshop. So it kind of fits with what Andrew was talking about the uh, the um, board game. And so um, so if you're interested in that, you can check that out. Um, and yeah, I think that's all. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, get out there and create some stuff. Thank you all. Have a great day.